Um, assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Jamal Haisal uh, from the United States. Uh, I was asked to talk a little bit about my story and my coming to Islam. Um, I became Muslim in 1992, August 8th, 1992. So my anniversary is actually coming up in it. Uh, this being what July. Um, I guess uh, the one thing, there was no really one thing that brought me to Islam. Uh, and to be quite honest, there really wasn't any da'wah work either. It was just something that Allah SWT just uh, inclined me towards. Uh, but to be more specific about my story, um, in the late 80s in America, there was a big uh, discussion, there was a big revival of people learning about their blackness, about their African heritage. And uh, whether you were Caribbean black, uh, whether you were black from uh, Latino black, like from Puerto Rico or Cuba or the Dominican Republic or you know from Haiti or anything like this, um, everything was about going back to Africa and uh, learning about who we were as a people in Africa and the greatness of black people and the contributions that blacks have uh, have uh, uh, have placed in in history in America, in Europe, as well as the accomplishments in Africa itself. And so, uh, even though there was a great big, everybody was centering everything around Egypt as if all black people came out of Egypt, um, we um, uh, were going to like a lot of Egyptology classes and listening to these different things. Because, you know, it, became, it was kind of a faddish thing because people were really into this thing about knowledge and, you know, gaining knowledge of self and stuff like that. And, you know, like a lot of pseudo uh, Afrocentric groups popping up out of nowhere. and you know, really just trying to uh, buy into the time and the fad and uh, wound up really making it an obsolete movement, in my opinion. Um, it became very watered down towards the end, but that was when uh, Islam became a big discussion again, you know, and it was a big revival of Malcolm X, and, uh, and this is when the Nation of Islam, in my opinion, became its strongest after uh, it was dismantled by Warth D. Muhammad. And, uh, uh, Louis Farrakhan became the prominent spokesperson for the uh, the Nation of Islam. Actually, became the leader, and so um, during this time period, you know, even with the rappers, you know, during that time period, uh, a lot of people were talking about Islam. You know, you hear the word Islam and the law from time to time. Never the messenger of Allah said them, but you hear about a law and you hear about Islam, and you know, like you had Eric B. Eric B. and Rakim, you know, as being, you know, by name some of the bigger Muslim names. Kwame and uh, these people and then Public Enemy, you know, actually getting involved with Louis Farrakhan and then later down the line, Ice Cube, you know, after he left NWA, he came, you know, got, a, you know, uh, touched or influenced a little bit by Louis Farrakhan and, you know, then he started changing the way he was presenting himself and so on and so forth. So, you know, we had a lot of pseudo-Islamic groups popping up too uh, during that time period. So, you know, I had a little bit of exposure, you know, I was living in Chicago around that time period as well. Uh, but I was in the university, and when I was in the university, I took a course in Black American Studies. Uh, and, uh, you know, obviously we started talking about Africa, and when you talk, you talk about Africa, you cannot talk about Africa and not talk about Islam. So, we started really getting into this thing about Islam, and so we started learning about Islam. Uh, very briefly, that was a kind of a, you know, a high-level overview of Islam in Africa, not so much Islam as the religion itself. And uh, so I remember one time, uh, during one summer, I was at my father's house, and my stepmother, um, her brother had gone to Egypt to climb pyramids, and they were doing a class in, Egypt, in Egyptology. And uh, I was watching the video, and I remember on the video, there was uh, this discussion about how the pharaohs uh, actually had a third eye, and how like their little little snakes in their on their headdresses actually was the encasement for that third eye. And I started thinking to myself, you know, I'm not really a fighter, even though I fought and all this kind of stuff. I, you know, I'm more of a man of knowledge, so you know, I want my third eye. You know, I want to I want to have that higher level of knowledge, and so. Um, I decided to set out to figure out how to get it. So when I got back to my university, I was sitting in my dorm room, which I guess you guys call a hostel, and um, 
I was sitting there one day and said, okay, how will I obtain my third eye in terms of developing a high level of knowledge? So the first thing I started thinking about was, okay, can I get it through my physics? No, that's not going to do it. Could I do it in my philosophy, my philosophy class? That definitely won't get it. Because uh, I'm still trying to figure out the answer. Um, I thought maybe I'll go to my mathematics because I was taking calculus. I was an engineering student at the time. So I thought maybe mathematics could help answer some, some of the questions. Definitely not. So then I said, okay, religion, spirituality, specifically. Not religion, but spirituality. So, you know, I went, I went back to my church and I got rebaptized. I started joining the church, started reading the Bible more, uh, and found that it was still kind of dead. Um, I met, you know, well, first off, I never really believed that God was, uh, Jesus and God were the same. I never believed that Jesus was God. I never believed that, um, uh, that there could be a son and a father and a Holy Ghost like that. I didn't believe that either. Uh, and a lot of questions that I used to ask the ministers, you know, I would never get the, a proper answer. I used to ask my mother, like, who would you pray to? And she would say, sometimes God, sometimes Jesus. Well, if they're the same people, then, you know, how are you, why, why do you make that distinction? So if you're making that distinction, obviously there's some differences here. You know, and then there was like one particular uh, story in the Bible that really got me was when G uh, Satan was talking to Jesus. Right? He said, um, and he was saying that, you know, if you were to throw away the teachings of your father, I will make you king of the lands, right? And I thought to myself, now, if Jesus was God, or even with God, as the Bible puts it out, or at least, you know, the, 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 the Christian theology our theologians put that out there, not necessarily this, you know, actually a doctrine. Well, it's part of the doctrine, but not based on truth or anything like that. But if this is the case, if Jesus was with God, or if Jesus is God, then, and Satan at one point was with God, then how is it that uh, Satan could tempt Jesus with anything? There can't be any temptation, because he already knows who it is, who this guy is. If he's truly the Son of God, then how could there be any point of temptation because if he if the son is like the father then the father then the son should know what the father knows and he also knows that you know basically my dad already owns all of this so what are, how are you going to make me king of something that you you can't first of all you got to get rid of the father and you can't even do that in order to make me king of the lands so that, that doesn't make any sense that's almost like that's like an insult to intelligence to not just the people listening but to Jesus himself if that were true so uh, I thought about that, and then secondly, uh, when he said that, uh, he says, well, if, if what you're saying is true, this is Satan again talking to Jesus, he says, then throw yourself off the side of the cliff and see if your father will help. And uh, Jesus, you know, replied, it is not for the servant to test the master, but for the master to test the servant, right? And so there he's saying, basically, you know, he's a servant to God, not necessarily the son of God, you know. Otherwise, the conversation wouldn't have been serving. It would have been more like, you know, it's not for the son to test the father. It's for the father to test the son. And it didn't come off like that. So I had an issue with that. So I just, at that, from that point on, I knew that there was a distinction between God and Jesus. And Jesus being the son of God and all this other stuff, I just didn't buy it. And, and this was about when I was like 9, 10 years of age. So, uh, moving right along. Um, as I was going back through reading the Bible and everything, trying to reconnect myself with God uh, spiritually, on a spiritual level, uh, I met this group called the Nubian Islamic Hebrews, which were led by this guy named Dr. York, who's in prison now. Uh, and this guy had a pseudo-Islamic group that was going around preaching Islam, and uh, you know they wore turbans and thobes and had these massive dicker beads, and you know, and, and uh, but their job or their thing was basically attacking Christians. And I sat with a few of their people and, you know, they took me through the Bible and pointed out some things to me that really opened my eyes about a lot of different things and they answered a lot of questions. However, I knew I could never become a part of their community because people I knew who had joined them in university were dropping out to be a part of their community. And, you know, they were on the corner selling oils and little books and stuff like that. And I was like, you know, how can a community, you know, survive off of selling oils and little books. You know, you need doctors and engineers, you need people who can develop infrastructure and bring in money to the community and so on and so on. And that doesn't sound like uh, a very viable thing to do. So I knew not to get with those people. And Alhamdulillah, Allah protected me from that. 
because uh, later they just went flip, you know, he just really just went on another deep end type thing, and so, mashallah. But anyhow, uh, after meeting them, I used to, I used to, anybody I met that was Muslim, you know, I would uh, try and talk to them and ask questions about Islam. Uh, I remember uh, meeting, um, I had some Malaysian friends, actually back in high school, but they really weren't giving dawah. They weren't really concerned about giving dawah. They were kind of more into, you know, living life in America. Their sisters, however, you know, they wore hijab, and I used to ask, well, why are they wearing that scarf on their head, you know? And they would tell me, oh, this is hijab, and this is part of our religion, and well, what religion is that? You know, they said Islam, and that would be the extent of it. You know, I, I didn't seem like they wanted to talk much about it, and I didn't care to ask any more questions. But uh, again, but once I got to university, when I started meeting people that were Muslim, uh, I um, uh, just start asking a lot more, you know, more questions and getting answers and invites to these different gatherings and stuff that I didn't really make, you know, because I was in college, I was in university, you know what I mean? I'm hanging out and partying and, and doing what I do. I uh, wasn't that serious about, you know, learning about a religion. I just casually would like to know. So that's kind of the approach that I took and that's the way I handled things. Um, and then as a... Uh, you know, one thing I do think about, if I had become Muslim while I was in university, I think I would have become an engineer, because all the Muslims were engineering students, and they were actually able to understand the work, and, you know, not being Muslim, I wasn't able to understand a lot of the work, and I didn't have the resources to go to to help me out the way I needed help. Uh, I wound up jumping out of the engineering program, went into political science with the hopes of becoming a, a lawyer, because uh, that was actually my ultimate plan anyway, never really to be an engineer. Just fit, get the degree, go to law school because it's easier for technical degree students to get into law school than students who have like liberal arts degrees and so on and so on. Anyways, um, so after uh, talking to a few people, I met an imam that I actually I've known his son since I was in high school, and I told his son that I wanted to talk to his father about Islam. So we met for lunch and uh, we talked about Islam and he gave me a copy of the Quran and I remember, I remember him telling me to keep it in a clean place, wash your hands before you read it because you know, I wasn't going to make wudu, but you know, he asked me to you know, wash my hands before I read it and, that, and so I, I respected it. You, know, you tell me it's the word of God, who am I to say otherwise? You know? So I said, all right, no problem. And so I would take it home and read it, you know, keep it nice, I put it on top of my bookshelf in my house. And, you know, just took care of it, and uh, you know, that's pretty much how I was doing things for a while. And uh, you know, and then every time on television you hear some like the poor righteous teachers or the brand Nubians who were uh, Muslim rappers or again pseudo Muslims because they were five percenters, and you know, they would get on um, on some interview, and I'm sitting down, I get you know, I'm all into it, listening, and you know, really want to hear their experience with Islam and so on and so on. And um, I remember my girlfriend. She used to get upset because see, her parent, her grandmother and aunt, they were Christian missionaries. And so they really didn't like, you know, the issue of me looking at Islam. And so she would always challenge, you think about becoming Muslim? Oh, no. I'm not going to become Muslim. Are you crazy? No, I won't do that. You know, I'm not trying to mess up my relationship, right? So, no, no. You know, and uh, I, rem I remember one day she told me, uh, she asked me that question because we had the guy from the Nation of Islam. He came to our university. And he did a big talk, and I was all into the talk, you know, because I'm about black power movements, and I'm about, you know, protests, I'm about the revolution, you know, and I'm all about, you know, knowledge of self, and, you know, we've got to change the way we're doing things, and we got to live at a higher standard as black people, and so on and so on, and even Latinos, we've got to change the way we do things, and we got to be better because the white man is keeping us down, and, you know, they don't care about us, and, you know, they're not going to do anything for us, and we've, we've got to do it ourselves, and blah, 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 and, um... And so, you know, I'm listening to this guy talking, and I'm all into the talk, and I come back, and uh, my girlfriend says, I don't know, you know, you seem a little too into that conversation, that, that, that the speech. And are you thinking about being Muslim? She asked me again. I said, no. You know, Muslims don't believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. I'm never giving up my belief in Jesus. That same night I said that, I remember going to the Quran, and as soon as I just, you know, just opened it, and that's usually how I attack the Quran. I just open the book, and, you know, just where it fell is where it fell. I just read whatever was open. And that particular day, I opened it up, and there was the whole conversation of Isa alayhi salam. You know, and it, and it started talking about his, uh, his birth. And then it started talking about, you know, about the things he said that, you know, I never told the people to worship me. 
and I never told anybody to to place me with you talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and basically exonerating himself from the actions of people and uh, then as I was reading it I said to myself you know Muslims do believe in Jesus hmm not only do they believe in Jesus they believe in Jesus the way I really believe in Jesus I just never knew how to articulate my feelings until I read it in the Quran so I said okay so that's out no more excuse there right and then the more I started reading the more I started liking uh, the aspects of the perception of Islam um, then I started reading the autobiography of Malcolm X and uh, as I was reading that you know you're reading about Muslim life you know I remembered hearing about um, how when the husband gets up he makes his wudu he gets the wife up, she makes her wudu, then they get the kids up and they get their wudu together and they all stand up to make prayer. And I thought, man, that's see, that's a family. That's nice. You know, the family's praying together, doing all this together. And that's what I'm talking about. Because, you know, being a Christian and being coming and coming from a household where I grew up with my mother and my father was never around, uh, it, you know, having family and family meant something really I mean, it meant a lot to me. So to hear that this is how the Muslim family does things is really amazing. I mean, there are Christian families, don't get me wrong, that do do this, but it's not the norm. You know what I mean? It's not like a, uh, it's, like a it's not like a tenet of faith. It's not like a doctrine or it's not like it's really just a part of everyday Christian life. I mean, although, though there will be those who say, yes, it is. But when you look at the majority, no, it really isn't. But then again, you know, you know mashallah. But that's how I saw it at that time. And again, we're talking about my perspective. So... There you have it. Um, uh, and I remember one time going to a, a bookstore, you know, one of the Afrocentric bookstores, and I was looking at some of the books, and I was looking at the Gospel according to Barnabas, and I was thinking about getting it, and did the owner of the bookstore and this other brother were talking, and they saw what I was looking at, and so we went through this big discussion about the, the Gospel according to Barnabas, and, and then I happened to notice one of the guys was Muslim, and his name happened to be Yusuf Ali. And... Uh, you know, when he left the bookstore, I, I, I ran out after him and said, excuse me, excuse me, I said, are you Muslim? He said, yeah. He says, hi, I, you know, my name is such and such, and, you know, I really would like to know more about Islam. I'm, I'm, I'm really interested. And so he took my number, I got his, and, you know, he called me, and we talked, and he invited me to his home. Now, when I got to his home, you know, his house was very clean and, uh, you know, spotless, you know, he had a little jazz music playing in the background. I thought it was really smooth, you know, very tranquil for me, and, um... Uh, we went out on this uh, patio that was screened in and you know his wife brought out fruits and drink and all this stuff and cakes and I was really shocked right you know uh, they didn't ask they just brought it you know and said have you know have a bite you know and I'm like no 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 thank you he says no 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 have a bite and I said what do you mean he says well in Islam when someone invites you over and they they uh, uh, basically host you know food for you you have to eat because if you don't eat, that means you came over here for some other reason, which means, uh, you know, basically you want to, you know, hurt somebody. You know, either you came over here for a suhba, or you came over here with amenity. You know, you came over here to, to engage in development of brotherhood and fellowship, or you came over here to call somebody harm. So I said, well, I ain't call, I don't want to cause harm. You know, so I ate the food. You know, which was different for me because in America, amongst most Christians, uh, not everybody has what we call good home training. So what happens is, is that the only time you might get some cake is if you happen to pass by the kitchen and you saw the cake was on the table and the people who live there saw that you saw the cake. So then they'll say, okay, hey, would you like some cake? You know, or would you like something to drink? You know, that's usually a lot of times in my experience anyways, uh, you know, getting, you know, good hospitality. You know, again, we call that good home training. Because there are some people who have very good home training, very hospitable people, very kind and warm and giving people. But I'm talking about the majority now, not the exceptions. But the majority of people don't have really good home training anymore. You know, you might find that in the south of America, but in the north and other places, maybe not. But nonetheless, uh, that's how it was for us, uh, or for me, specifically speaking. So, uh, much after that, uh, spending a lot of time with Yusuf and talking about Islam, I went to the masjid for the first time. And that in and of itself was a big difference because, you know, you go to church, you're used to the chairs, you know, I'm used to sitting near women, you know, you know, I used to check the girls out, you know, they used to be the best place to find a girl is church. You know, now the women in the back, I can't even see them, you know what I mean? I'm like, what's this? 
can you check out the living thing? What's going on here? Right? <laughs> so I'm sitting, uh, I'm sitting on the floor even, you know, which obviously my, my knees are not accustomed to, you know, I'm sitting on the floor for long periods of time, still not used to it, but mashallah, uh, even after have spent so much time in the Middle East, but mashallah. Um, and then having the opportunity to, uh, to listen to the, the khutbah, the sermon, and uh, and I had been reading up on the prayer because I wasn't going to sit off to the side when everybody got to pray. I wanted to make sure I did everything everybody else did. And, uh, you know, it was really nice. You know, it was really nice. And for me, the masjid that I went to in Chicago was uh, Masjid Al-Fatir, uh, which at that time was a beautiful place to be. Uh, it was a really wonderful place in Chicago on uh, uh, 47th Street. It was just really, really, really nice. And, uh, uh, mashallah. You just said people from all different nationalities there. I mean, you had a large African American population of people who had come out of the nation of Islam into Al Islam. Uh, you had people from Bosnia and Turkey, and you had people from Malaysia. You had people from Africa. Uh, you just had just so many, you know, Arabs that were there. You just had so many different people, and that allowed me to really say, "Wow, this is really a brotherhood," you know, because you don't see this in a regular church. You know, I think it was Martin Luther King said, or or some scholar said that. You know, the most segregated time in America is Sunday morning around 11 o'clock when church starts. Because you got, you know, the blacks in this church, the whites in this church, the Koreans in that church, the Latinos in that church, the Africans are in this church. You know, now some of your mega churches are trying to make it like, oh, no, no, we're all Christians, we're all God's children. And, you know, so they have the mixed congregations. You know, that's great, but the majority of the cities are still not like that. Um, but anyways, um, uh, it was just really nice to see, and I think that was the first time I saw an African American woman with a wearing a hijab, and I thought that was amazing because I always because you know American women love their hair, and they like showing it off. I mean, women go to the beautician, the beauty salon like once every week, you know, spending fifty, sixty dollars getting their hair done. It's only gonna last for a day and a day and a half maybe. Um, and so to see like an American woman wearing hijab to me was really amazing. Because uh, again, I'd always thought that was just something African women and Arab women did because they were the only women that I've ever seen wear hijab. And uh, I didn't even know what a Pakistani person was until I became Muslim and, um, and just saw them. And, you know, mashallah, it was just, it was really interesting to see. Uh, and actuality, um, I really thought that women with hijab actually were a lot prettier than women without it. Because, like, I'm a kind of person, I don't like women who wear a lot of makeup and stuff like that. And to see a woman, you know, I like to be able to see a woman's face. So I like women with short hairstyles better. I mean, I don't discriminate, but that was my, my position at that time. Uh, because I like to be able to see your face. And, you know, when you saw a woman with hijab, you could see her face. And you could see how beautiful she really was. And uh, versus, you know, all that hair that gets in the way. And you can't really tell. So I thought it was really interesting. And um, uh, I just thought, I was like, wow, this religion is okay. You know, it's not so bad. So as I started going on, uh, I think I finished the autobiography on Malcolm X. And when I finished that and I heard about his journey and I made parallels from his life to my own life and my own experiences and said as soon as I closed the book, I said, I want to be Muslim. Just by the line, I want to be Muslim. So I called my friend Yusuf Ali and told him I wanted to be Muslim. And uh, he said, yeah, inshallah, but I was getting, I was graduating from university and uh, I told him I was going to California to visit my father and uh, I wanted to just take shahada at his house, but he told me, no, uh, we're going to do it in the masjid so everybody else can benefit. But I couldn't do that until I came back from California. So when I went to graduate, my graduation took place, I, I met the imam again that I had given my, that had given me a Quran. And uh, he said to me, I told him I was going to accept Islam, and he said to me, well, okay, great, you've accepted Islam, or you've accepted the fact that you want to be Muslim, uh, and maybe with Allah you might be Muslim now, but you're going to accept Islam right now. You're not going to wait till you come back from California, because you may die in California, and uh, if you die, we want you to die in the state of Islam. That's a strong argument, so I said, okay. So I accepted Islam uh, with him and his wife. And then when I came back from Chicago, I didn't tell Yusuf Ali because I thought he'd be a little upset. So I took Shahada again in the masjid. And uh, after that, you know, I became Muslim. 
you know, one of the things I thought was funny after becoming Muslim, because prior to becoming Muslim, when everybody met me in the masjid, everybody was like, oh, if you need any help, we're here, we're here, here's my number, here's that. And then after I became Muslim, nobody had time for me. <laughs> it took me a long time just to learn Fatiha. So, you know, but mashallah, I was patient, and Allah was merciful, and He allowed me to learn a lot more about my deen than just the Fatiha. Uh, I didn't tell my parents right away, because, you know, many people that had become Muslim basically got kicked out the house. You know, they were shunned by their families, ostracized, and, and basically uh, disowned in a lot of cases. Uh, and I wasn't ready for that. So I took a while, it took me a while for me to tell my family. But when I did finally tell them, they accepted it. Uh, they thought it was just something, uh, a fad. They thought it was just a, uh, a whim, something I was just going through for the moment. But when they saw I was serious, especially when I said I'm moving to Syria to study, you know, they went ballistic a little bit, you know. And, couldn't believe that this guy was really going to do this and you know and I did and you know they're still okay with it I think the biggest problem my family has with me and my Islam is trying to figure out what to feed me because they you know they, they're not very clear about the Islamic diet you know and it's kind of hard to explain to them what halal is I just say look I'm vegetarian so you know I might eat some fish you know just to make it easy for them you know my parents still can't even say Yemen correct it's still Yemen or they can't say Muslim, they still say Muslim or Muslim or, you know. So, just time. And my parents are very educated, mind you. My mother's, both my parents have, like, more than two to three degrees. So, you know, it's, uh, it's just kind of funny. So, I just, you know, we take time with them and be patient. Um, and I guess, you know, if I were to say anything to those of you who are new Muslims, um, especially in this country, just take your time, be patient. Uh, really try to learn as much as you can about your Creator. Uh, take time to learn your Tawheed first, uh, because your Tawheed, as, as many of the Ulema say, is that you have to know who it is you're worshiping uh, before you start really going through things. Even Imam Ghazali says that, uh, you know, worship is not valid unless you understand who it is you're worshiping. So the thing we want to do is, is really try to take time to learn about Allah and, uh, uh, and understand Him through His attributes. And, uh, and then from there, you know, learn your fiqh. Uh, because you got to learn how to improve uh, and perfect your devotional acts to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through your salah, your fasting, charity, and hajj, and uh, uh, fasting, and so on and so on. So uh, these are the things. And uh, the last question that was ever asked to me was that, you know, did I ever find my third eye? Well, because, yes, I did. Well, let's put it, let's put it this way. I have not gotten my third eye yet, but I'm on my way. and uh, And that's because of uh, the spirit, the, the lessons of, uh, as some people call it, teskia, as other people call it, tasawwuf, other people call it, uh, uh, but the, regardless of what you call it, it's about the nearness of Allah and worshiping Allah as though you see Him. And through these things, and, uh, and to rem remember Allah much, remembering Allah much, and, and sending Allah's salams upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and increasing my love for both Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, I'm on my way. I'm on my way. So alhamdulillah, and I hope that you'll be on your way. Well, remember me in your dua, inshaAllah. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah.